Hey there, my name is Leah. Today is Tuesday, you'll see this on a Wednesday. So that means it's time for Get Ready With Murder. This is a weekly series on my channel where I will talk about a true crime story while I do my makeup. So if you wanna hear the story of the unicorn killer, make sure you stay tuned. Here we go. Um, as usual, I will just show you the products that I'm using and everything will be in the description box below. Today we are going to talk about the Unicorn Killer Ira Einhorn. Einhorn was born in 1940. He was born to a pretty average middle class um, Jewish family and by the time he went to college at the University of Pennsylvania he started to get into some activism which you know tends to happen when you hit college. Um, so this would have been right in the 60s. So there was, you know, a lot of stuff to get involved in as far as activism goes. He was really into um, ecological activism. So like the first Earth Day in 1970, he attended and participated in, but said he was instrumental in creating and um, organizing, but no. Uh, there's some dispute about that. And because it was the 60s when he was in college and more, he was also um, part of the anti-war movement. Um, the Vietnam War was going on, super anti-establishment. So he became pretty radicalized in the 60s and apparently was a really um, kind of imposing force. So he was a large person, he had like piercing blue eyes, um, he was great at networking. He was verbally talented, so he was good at you know speaking and writing and just getting really people behind him and rallied and just super excited. And because he was so talented at getting people to like him and kind of follow him and network, along with being part of this counterculture, he had lots of famous friends, got to know a lot of um, like celebrities and really important influential people like Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. He was into LSD and pill popping and pot, just anything that you think of from that scene in Forrest Gump in the 60s where Jenny started doing all the drugs and getting involved with the Black Panther Party. <laughs> that was all kind of his scene. So in 1972, Einhorn started dating Holly Madu. Maddo, it's um, M-A-D-D-U-X. I'm gonna say Madu for the rest of the video. If it's wrong, I apologize. Holly was kind of your all-American looking girl. She was you know, blonde hair, blue-eyed, from Texas, was a cheerleader, was super smart. She went to Bryn Mawr, um, and when she met Einhorn, of course, she was enamored with, you know, his presence and his rhetoric and just everything he had to say, so she was totally into him. But as their relationship progressed, she would come to find out that although he was a person who spoke a lot about peace and love and togetherness and harmony. He was not all about that in relationships. He's kind of a dick. In his past relationships, he had been abusive um, to his previous girlfriends. And we all know that one day you just don't stop. Um, so he started being abusive towards Holly. He was physically abusive, verbally and mentally, because you know, that's where it always starts. So after about five years of this relationship, Holly got just, she was done. She was tired of it. She moved to New York City um, to get away from Einhorn. And while she was there, she met a new man who was super sweet, um, just like gentle and loving and fell head over heels for him. Um, so. While she was there, she called Einhorn and said, in case you haven't figured out by the fact that I moved away from you, this relationship is officially over. So this pissed off Einhorn, who threatened to put all of her belongings out into the street and set them on fire or just throw them in the garbage unless she came to get them like that day. Like any normal person not wanting to have all of their stuff completely destroyed, um, on September 9th of 1977, Holly left Philadelphia to go to New York to get her stuff and then return to New York and to her new beautiful boyfriend named Saul. However, Holly was never heard from again. Um, her family started getting a little suspicious that she had been kind of gone on this trip for so long. It had been a few days, her mom's birthday had come and gone and Holly hadn't even called. So that's really what made her family um, 
believed that she was, you know, considered a missing person and something bad had happened to her. So her family called police. Um, they got the information from Saul that she had gone back to get her stuff from Einhorn. So the police went over to Einhorn's place and apparently the information that he gave them was either not helpful or just circumstantial or, you know, enough for them to think that, you know, they didn't need to talk to him anymore. So they left his apartment, they had no further leads, and the case kind of went cold for a while. Um, Holly's family was extremely not happy um, with how the investigation went as far as the police were concerned, so they hired a few private investigators. Um, the investigators kept an eye on Einhorn because he basically, after that day, went back to his normal life went on speaking tours, and even participated in a fellowship at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. By 1979, um, the investigators found enough information to give to the police, which actually got them to uh, issue a search warrant for Einhorn's apartment. It included things like him asking friends to help move a trunk that included secret documents from his apartment, um, a, bad smell coming from his place and some brown icky liquid leaking down to a neighbor's below and just his general not wanting to cooperate the first time around. Um, he stated that Holly had um, come to get her stuff and before she left she'd gone to the local store to pick up some sprouts and tofu uh, and he'd never seen her again and was kind of really unwilling to answer any further questions after that. So on March 28th of 1979, um, like 19 months after the last time she'd been seen, um, the police served in, or the police issued a search warrant to Einhorn's apartment and they found a few interesting artifacts. In a closet of Einhorn's apartment, they found pretty much all of Holly's stuff that she would have had for the weekend. Um, a suitcase with personal belongings that had her social security card, her driver's license, um, some other things that clearly were hers. And then in that same closet was a big old locked trunk. The police officer asked Einhorn to, you know, can you please open this trunk so I can take a look at it? And Einhorn said he had lost the key, he can't even remember where it is, um, it's just, you know, papers in that trunk, you don't need to look in there. Um, the police officer said, well, we have to look, so you need to break the lock, and he said, okay, fine. And they broke open the lock. Of course, inside the trunk was Holly's body. He had packed her in the trunk with styrofoam, newspapers, air fresheners. So all of that together partially mummified her body. Um, and then it was also partially decomposed. Okay, this is where it's gonna get a little unsettling. So Holly had been uh, hit in the head. She suffered blunt force trauma to the point where it fractured her skull. But this fucking guy didn't kill her at this point. Based on the position of her body and the size of the trunk, they found that due to the position of her body and the size of the trunk, uh, they were able to determine that Holly was placed in the trunk in a semi-conscious state and the blunt force trauma didn't kill her. She actually died trying to claw her way out of the trunk. And because this guy is a massive piece of shit, when the police officer said, it looks like I found Holly's body, he shrugged and said, you found what you found. So here's something interesting that I learned while I was researching this case. Pennsylvania doesn't have degrees of murder. You either murdered someone or you didn't. So Einhorn was of course immediately charged with murder and got some fancy pantsy lawyer because of his influence as a activist. His lawyer somehow miraculously argued for him to be let out on $40,000 worth of bail. Even in 1979, for murder in a case like this, that is a very low amount for bail. And of that, only 10% had to be paid. So for him to walk free on murder charges, he only had to pay out $4,000. And, and, 
and he didn't even pay it. He got one of his fancy, rich socialite friends to pay his bail for him. Now that he's out on bail, he has basically the world to himself while he... is waiting for his trial to start. Uh, he kind of is still trying to run in his circles of influence, is telling anybody with ears to listen to him that it is a setup by the CIA or the FBI to discredit him because of his activism and political leanings, that they know that he's completely right and they don't want him to be popular anymore. And how the justice system works is when you are charged with a crime and you are able to post bail, you are basically out and free until your court date for your trial. Um, you have to like check in with people every once in a while, but basically you're free to go live your life until you are required to come back to court. And when you don't show up, that's called skipping bail. And skipping bail is exactly what Einhorn did at his very first court date. Because not only is he a murderer, he's apparently a coward too. This is January of 1981. Um, and after kind of discovering that Einhorn was not only not in court, he was not at his place, he was not in Philadelphia. He was not in the United States. He had traveled abroad. Eventually they tracked him down to Dublin and were able to kind of track his movements across Europe a bit. He went um, kind of all around the UK and ended up in France. His entire trip, I guess we'll say, was funded by the same um, socialite woman who paid his bail initially to get out of jail years earlier. By 1994 though she started to feel pretty guilty. Um, she kind of had always really believed in Einhorn um, but by this time she kind of figured out that maybe he was kind of feeding her a line this entire time. Um, so she gave the detectives on the case the um, phone number and address to the place that she knew that he was at and this time he was in Stockholm. When the detectives got to this address, they found a woman named Anna there, um, claimed she did not know Ira Einhorn, she knew him as Ben, I'm sorry, as Ben Moore, but that she hadn't seen him in a long time and had absolutely no idea where he was. And because that sounds like total bullshit, they ran her name through Interpol and actually found out that she had then relocated to France and married a man by the name of Eugene Mallon, who is actually Ira Einhorn. Finally, in 1997, they were able to track down Einhorn to a small village in France near Cognac, and they arrested him. However, him being in France meant that he could not be extradited to the United States because while he was gone, the Pennsylvania justice system held his trial in absentia, which means he wasn't there, but they still went forward with the trial, found him guilty, and gave him a life sentence. The European Convention of Human Rights has rules that denies the legitimacy of trials held in absentia that result in life sentences. So that means he could not be extradited from France back to the United States to serve his life sentence. And then in 1998, Pennsylvania passed a law that would basically grant him a completely new trial, which means that he got to be arrested again and then would await an extradition trial in France at this point. So he got a fancy ass lawyer who came in and had all of these um, excuses why he couldn't be extradited, that it was you know unfair and unjust and all of this. So eventually the French courts said, we don't know the laws of the United States well enough to be able to speak on this. It has to go to the French prime minister. After years of back and forth, finally in 2000, the French Prime Minister granted the extradition. Of course, Einhorn and his lawyer, who is probably kind of a scumbag lawyer, continued to appeal um, up to the higher courts in France 
and eventually they still upheld the extradition order. This one. So in July of 2001, Einhorn was finally back in the United States and went to stand trial for the murder of Holly. The trial only lasted for four weeks and Einhorn was still sticking to his CIA frame to be story, um, which didn't go over super great with the jury because they found him guilty. So after all of this, the sentencing judge in this case sentenced him to life without the possibility of parole, and to this day he is still serving that sentence. That is the story of the murder of Holly Madu by Ira Einhorn, the unicorn killer. Okay, now that we've come to the end of the story, you might be thinking, Leah, you said this was the story of the unicorn killer, but I didn't hear any unicorn talk. No fairies, no elves, no pegasus, no unicorn. <laughs> so the story is that actually there's no actual unicorns involved. The guy's last name is Einhorn, which in German directly translates to one horn, but it's actually the word that they use for unicorn, and that's how he got named the unicorn killer. It was probably a lot more interesting to write up in newspapers and stories online to have the unicorn killer instead of crazy hippie kills his girlfriend. Alright you guys, so that is going to be it for me today. I really hope you liked this video. I'm sorry it was a long one, but it was a crazy story. And with that, I thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. There's a brand new Get Ready With Murder every Tuesday, well probably Wednesday in this case. So make sure you're subscribed so you can catch every single Get Ready With Murder. All right, you guys, have a super great rest of your day, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye, 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 bye.